everyone. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Catherine Ketcher. I'm Director of International Programs here at Mount Mercy. And on behalf of all of us here at the college, I'd like to welcome you to the Faculty Forum. Um, for the Czech speaking audience. Um, if you've watched the news over the past few weeks, you've probably seen the images of the dramatic events that took place in Eastern Europe 20 years ago. The opening of the border between Hungary and Austria, Germans streaming out of East Berlin and attacking the Berlin Wall with hammers, hundreds of thousands of people peacefully protesting in Prague. We're fortunate tonight to have two speakers who witnessed and even participated in the nonviolent or velvet revolution in Czechoslovakia in 1989 in the events that brought down the communist control of that country. Dr. Jim Grove, professor of English, has taught at Mount Mercy since 1980. He holds a BA from the University of Minnesota, a Master of Arts in Theology from St. Thomas University, and an MA and PhD from Southern Illinois University. Dr. Grove was twice selected for a prestigious Fulbright Fellowship and was instrumental in establishing the partnership between Mount Mercy and Polotsky University in the Czech Republic. 20 years ago, Dr. Grove arrived in what was then Czechoslovakia to teach at Polotsky University, and so was an observer to the events leading up to and including the Belgrade Revolution. Mount Mercy is very pleased to host our second speaker, Dr. Libor Prager, a professor of British and American Studies at Polotsky University, who's visiting Mount Mercy through the Fulbright Scholar in Residence program. Dr. Prager has a PhD in American Literature from Polotsky University. This fall and winter, he's teaching literature and film classes here at Mount Mercy, and he's also been very engaged in the Cedar Rapids community, speaking to audiences at the Rotary Club, the National Czech and Slovak Museum and Library, and serving as a consultant for Theater Cedar Rapids. Um, coincidentally, this is not the first time Dr. Prager has been to Cedar Rapids. Um, he studied at Mount Mercy nearly 20 years ago the first student to take part in the exchange program between Mount Mercy College and Polatsky University. In 1989, while still an undergraduate student, Dr. Prager was both witness to and participant in the Velvet Revolution. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the support of the Fulbright Scholar in Residence program, through which Mount Mercy has been able to host Dr. Prager. This Fulbright exchange is a State Department program designed to promote mutual understanding between the people of the United States and the people of other countries of the world and we hope that tonight's lecture will contribute toward that, towards that goal. Um, I'd also like to thank very much Dr. Blake and the leadership here at Mount Mercy for supporting our Fulbright application. Uh, please join me in welcoming Jim Grove and Libor Frogger. Uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Thanks for coming. Um, it seems like just yesterday, uh, that the Belgian Revolution started. Um, I'm the outside view, and he's the insider. We're going to go back and forth and talk about different things that we both saw and experienced. Uh, I was in Vienna the weekend the revolution started, and I, my sister had come in unexpected, not unexpectedly, but she had come in to visit us, and so I spent the weekend in Vienna with her. And it wasn't until I got back into Olomutz that I found out something had happened, that there had been a clash between police and protesters on the Friday, November 17th in, in Prague. And I was getting off the tram with my sister in Old Woods, and one of my students said, Jim, you know, we're on strike. There's a meeting at 8 o'clock. And that was the first time. I didn't know what he was talking about. And that night, the British lecturer and I, we went to the dorms of the uh, philosophical faculty and that's the faculty that Libor was part of. And we watched the strike leaders be chosen. And I think you can recognize one of the strike leaders right here. <laughs> <laughs> you notice a little bit more hair back there, don't you think? <laughs> but he was chosen as one of the five strike leaders from the philosophical faculty. And um, it was quite tense and hectic, that meeting. I didn't understand a lot that was going on. The British lecturer knew a was a, could explain a little bit more for me. And uh, what we found out, though, there was going to be a meeting the next day at 9 o'clock in the auditorium in the philosophical faculty where the students would come together and meet the um, communist authorities on campus. And I thought that the way I would describe this, one of my most memorable 
or one of my uh, greatest memories of the whole time is to read what I wrote for the Gazette at the time about this meeting. The family administration representing communist authority would try to convince, perhaps even bully, the students into ending the strike. The students, in turn, would appeal to their teachers for support. The communist officials sat on a stage rather imperiously, not yet believing that their substantial power might be seriously threatened within a week's time. Their public stance was to argue that the students did not know what they were doing, that their strike was dangerous and not realistic, that it was political madness, and one of the um, authorities had told one of the strike leaders that if they were like, and they were, in, they were, it was like as if they were entering an intersection with the red light on, and he, did, he said, you know what happens to cars when they enter an intersection with a red light on? They get destroyed. So there was a danger. There was real danger here. The students, however, stubbornly held on. During the long public meeting, the leaders stated their strike demands forcefully. Students from the audience questioned and sometimes challenged the officials, and I sensed that the communist representatives were becoming increasingly frustrated. They kept on, though, heavily putting on pressure, heavily. And one of the strike leaders um, kept on rebutting everything they said on the stage. The session ground on and on. The students were not permitted to end. They needed to have some of their teachers openly support them. And so finally what happened is the teachers, one teacher after another, came on the stage and gave the students their support. And this was so important because without this, um, the students were out there way too out, way, way too far out. They needed the support. After that day, that day, the students decided that they would have a march that night. And it was tense. And I remember going to a meeting where they discussed the march. And there was some real worries that the authorities would come and break up the march in the main square. Um, my sister decided, said she would take care of my, my daughter, Maggie, who was four years old at the time. So Linda, my wife, and I decided that we would go down to the main square and wait for the march to come. Um, we thought it was a little dangerous. I don't think we realized how dangerous it was. Uh, I, in fact, I only found out recently how dangerous this might have been. But we went down there to wait for them. Uh, and we waited, and we waited, and we waited on this cold night, really cold night, um, and to the point where we wondered if they were even going to come. And all of a sudden, these little flickers of light started appearing down this one avenue, one road leading into the main square, a narrow, narrow road. And you have to understand, Olamutz, if the lights were off at night, this was before there were a lot of cars, at night it appeared you had gone back five centuries at this time. It had that look at night. But these little flickers of light, and as slowly the students started coming, and in their hands were candles, and these candles were representative emblems of their support for the people who had been beaten in Prague the Friday before. They kept on coming and coming and coming. The estimate was that 4,000 students finally were into the square. Um, when they came by us, they looked scared. They looked very cold. Um, they also looked very committed. I talked to one student before the, the afternoon, and I asked her why she was going. She said, well, she was very frightened. And her boyfriend was going, and made her even more frightened because he had had a fall a couple years before, and she was worried if he got hit at all on the head, he would be, uh, it might be fatal or really a serious damage to him. And I said, "Well, why are you going then?" And she says, "Well, why? I'm going, I'm going because the reason why everybody's going. We have to. We're tired of communism. If this doesn't work, she says, I'm leaving the country." So we had students coming by, a new few of them. They came by with the candles. They came into the square, and luckily there was no violence. The police never came. The Secret Service probably were there, but there was no violence. Um, by the way, the person during that meeting in the morning who stood up to the, the administration at the school was a very cocky student that I'd had in school, um, somebody who had great self-confidence, and I don't think was frightened of anything. <laughs> who also was one of the worst students at that time I'd ever had. Because he was, yeah. And that's your next speaker. 